In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, illumine our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge. Good morning. <clears throat> Today is the Sunday before the Nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we heard the, from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the genealogy. This is also known as the Sunday of the genealogy. The genealogy of Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This genealogy is split into three portions of 14 generations, each from Abraham to David, uh, first from Abraham to David, second from David to Jeconiah, and from Jeconiah to Joseph on the third portion. So in a way, this is the way the church is sort of framing time for us if we look at it through that lens. We, we don't see it maybe in terms of years. Maybe we see it in terms of uh, the faithful in Christ throughout the generations. And St. Simeon, the new theologian, teaches on this about the rib of Adam being, being the Theotokos herself. So much can be said about this great and wondrous mystery of the incarnation of the Son of God in the flesh and the two genealogies found both in Matthew and in St. Luke. But why do they differ? So one starts with Abraham, the other starts with, with Adam. <clears throat> and why do they differ? What parts are the same? We could demonstrate that Christ is both the son of Abraham, through whom the promise came, and the son of David, the king of Israel, and even the son of Adam, who is the son of God, through the genealogy of St. Luke. How both Joseph and Mary were of the house of David, so to fulfill the prophecies. We could also speak about how the apostle Matthew is demonstrating the faithfulness of God to his promises or the pre-incarnate theophanies occurring at appointed times before his incarnation <clears throat> as types of what were to come. All of this would be to our great benefit. But let us instead reflect specifically on what the church is communicating to us in, this, in her beautiful poetic imagery, uh, hymnography and imagery, starting with Great Vespers, in order to gain a deeper understanding of this, of this glorious prefeast. What mystery is she bringing to our attention? If we were to summarize the emphasis of what the church hymns show us in this commemoration, it would be the mystery of the incarnation from these two events, Daniel and the lion's den, and in the fiery furnace, the three holy youths, and the one who is likened to a son of God. If you were able to attend the service last yesterday evening, you would have heard some of the most beautiful hymnography of the year. The service of Great Vespers has as its central point the hymn of Psalm 140 and 141, Lord, I have cried. This is a melismatic hymn that is appointed each Vespers and Great Vespers. Interwoven between the verses of Psalm 141 are the hymns of tro or troparia that are called stichera, which are always, always themed for the festal commemoration that's being given attention to that day. And in the case of last night, you would have heard themes for both the resurrection on Sunday today, but also for the, the Sunday before the nativity. So let's look a bit closer at each one of these stichera in, in order to see what the church is teaching us about the significance of this particular commemoration. First, from the first stichera last yesterday evening, we hear the following, quote, as we the faithful celebrate today the forefathers' memory, let us praise Christ the Redeemer and our King, who magnified them in the midst of all nations upon the earth, and through faith accomplished strange and wondrous signs, performing marvels and miracles, since he is powerful and strong, and who from them hath shown unto us the rod of power prophesied, Mary, the child of God, who alone had no experience of man, and from whom came the flower, the promised Christ, who sprouted life for all, inexhaustible delight, and our salvation to eternity. So what is meant by that rod of power prophesied and, 
and from whom came the flower. If we think about what was contained in the Ark of the Covenant, there were three things in the Old Testament when we read about the Ark of the Covenant. The law, given in tablets of stone, the manna, and the rod that budded forth the flower when the high priest was chosen for that year. So the Virgin Mary herself is both the ark and the rod that budded forth Christ. He is our high priest. The ark, because her womb contained the uncontainable God, our Redeemer and King, and the rod, because from her womb came our high priest, who makes the sacrifice upon the heavenly altar. So this altar behind us is an icon of the heavenly altar. And we, we should see at elevating our minds to this reality. Christ is our Redeemer and our salvation to eternity. And not only, not only to a particular nation and people, but now to all nations upon the earth. So the second stikira says the following. As, as in a gentle, so quote, as in a gentle shower midst the flame, the children of God rejoiced as they walked about the midst of the, the spirits do, and in the flame they mystically did prefigure the Trinity and the wondrous incarnation of Christ God, since they were wise by their faith in God. They quenched the power of the fire, and righteous Daniel was also seen to muzzle lions in the din, since thou, O friend of man, art entreated by their prayers in our behalf. Rescue us all, O Savior, from the eternal fire that not can quench, and vouchsafe that we attain unto thy kingdom in the heavens, O Lord. Here we can see even more symbolic imagery and more deeper reality that we need to elevate our minds to understand. We have reference to the unquenchable fire that cannot be quenched, but yet the holy youths experience the fire as a refreshing dewy breeze. Here the fire seems to be intelligible, as St. John Chrysostom says, for it both destroys the guards who cast the youths into the fire, while at the same time preserves them in the midst of the flames. Here the church is showing us that the love of God is a consuming fire, and that the love can either be experienced as a fire of torment, or as a life-giving fire that refreshes us for eternity. However, the Spirit's due can only be acquired through humility, repentance, prayer, and all the ascetical practices that bring us into union with God, which the youths in Daniel both demonstrate for us. If we are prideful and a slave to our passions, faithless and unbelieving, then the spiritual flame is experienced as torment. The obedience to God's commandments, fasting and prayer, or through obedience to God's commandments, fasting and prayer, Daniel was able to shut the mouths of the lions and interpret the, the dreams of King Nebuchadnezzar. He was taken up to heaven and given divine vision in order to interpret the dreams and also to see the Ancient of Days being carried on the four beasts which pre are, are prefigured or prefigured the, gospel, the four gospel writers. We are all called to the same vocation, and may God give us this grace to, fall, to so follow these examples. In the third stakura, it says, When in the furnace of the blazing flame, the holy and faithful youths proved to be as in a cool, refreshing dew, then did they mystically portray from before that thou wast to come, from a virgin whom thy brightness would not burn. As for thy coming the second time, in thy dread glory as our God, the wondrous prophet and righteous man, great Daniel, clearly hath foretold. When he cried out and said, I beheld until the thrones were set in place, and the judge sat for judgment, and then rushed forth the, that river of fire, from which may we be saved, by their entreaties, O our Master Christ. So here we see an imagery starting to come into view, not only of the incarnation, but also of the second coming. So we are told that the mystery of the furnace being a type of Mary's womb, which contained God's brightness, yet it did not burn her. 
And a fourth figure appears in the midst of the flames, one who is likened unto the Son of God. This is, uh, of course, a pre-incarnate theophany of Christ himself. The Son of God, whom the Babylonian king sees as an angel in the midst of the flames. Immediately the hymns tie this mystical portrayal of his first coming in the incarnation already to his second coming, when Christ will come in glory on his judgment seat, and the river of fire that flows from him can either be, be our salvation or our everlasting torment based on our orientation. If we are prepared through life, through a life given to repentance and taking up our cross daily, God will conform us to his likeness, and we will experience him as did the holy youths in Daniel. And lastly, in case anyone has doubt what the church is teaching us about the ever-virginity of Mary, the Theotokos, or is scandaled by it, let us hear the blessed Theophylact in his very succinct argument putting our doubt to rest. He uses the two quotes that causes the, probably the most confusion in these regards and clarifies them. First from the prophet Isaiah, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. The Jews say that it is written in the prophecy, not virgin, but young woman. To which it may be answered, virgin and young woman mean the same thing in scripture. <laughs> For in scripture, young woman refers to one who is still a virgin. Furthermore, if it was not a virgin that gave birth, how would it be a sign? Something extraordinary. Listen to Isaiah who says, For this reason the Lord himself shall give you a sign. A virgin shall behold the virgin. So, if it was not a virgin who gave birth, it would not be a sign. The second passage. But knew her not until she had borne a son. Here, the, the word until might be a little bit confusing and might give some doubt as to whether she remained a virgin after birth. So now let us listen to this simple logical reasoning from Blessed Theophylact to dispel any doubt in our minds. Here he is, quote, Until here does not mean that before the birth he did not know her and then afterwards he did, but that he absolutely never knew her. Scripture employs this expression, for example, the raven returned not unto the ark until the water had dried off from the earth. But neither did it return after it dried off. Again, I am with you until the end of the world. So then after the world will end, he will no longer be with the saints? But how can this be? For in that time, more than ever will he be with them. So must, so must you understand here, until she, bring, she brought forth, to mean neither before the birth nor after the birth, did he know her. How could he have touched the Holy Virgin, having once understood the ineffable birth giving? So now, having no doubt in our minds of the works of wonder wrought before us, let us be encouraged to finish the course of this fast well and enter into the final week with holy zeal to God's commandments in love to one, for one another. And in doing so, we will be held the strange and wonderful mystery. Heaven is the cave the cherubic throne, the virgin, the uncontainable God, whom we magnify in song. Now may our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, through his incarnation, plant in us the divine seed and grow us into the tree of life. May we bear fruits worthy of our repentance. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.